So, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, and, and thank you enormously for the invitation. It's great to come to Bio Curation. Um, this is a community that really understands the importance of, of, of biological data resources and the importance of sustaining those resources, and that's going to be my, my, my topic. So my career route into data infrastructure, where I now find myself, um, was through bio-curation, and a couple of decades ago, I, I started working as a, a, a bio-curator. And um, within a few years, I found myself in California. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to find me. I think that's me, where the arrow is. I'm not sure. But I found myself at the first international meeting of this group. So it's been great to see the, um, the, the, um, that this carried on, that it's grown and it's matured, and, and it's great to be here. So what I'm going to present is the work of the Global Biodata Coalition. Um, this is all about sustaining the efforts that we make um, to, to produce data resources and to sustain and to deliver those data resources. I'm going to start by, I don't have to say too much about um, to justify data resources and to make their case, but I'll start by talking about the, the, the perspective that GBC takes, how it came about, uh, how it works and what it, what it intends to do. And then I'll talk about two specific areas in which we're working. The first really relates to things happening on the data resource side, on the infrastructure side. Um, so work with the people uh, such as yourselves that run um, uh, data resources. And then um, uh, the, the second part is to look at the, uh, what the funders are doing, so what the funder perspective is and, and things that are happening there. And then I'll finish up by uh, trying to relate that uh, to a few items on our, which I think GBC and the bio-curation community can engage in future. So to start with the, the, the backstory and the, the emergence of GBC. And so by data resources, the databases and the um, the, the services on those databases that, that capture, organize, add value to, and make available um, life science data are absolutely crucial. There are many of them, but together they make up a real infrastructure. One of the challenges is that it's an infrastructure that's unlike uh, many other scientific infrastructures. If you compare it to a, um, a, a particle accelerator or an astronomer's telescope, um, this is a much more distributed system, so it's much more difficult to see. It's very difficult to get a feel for exactly what it is and how it's used, um, but it's equally important as an infrastructure for the life science community. Uh, and in fact, if you're a researcher of any type within the life sciences, then it's very unlikely that any of the work you do doesn't either produce data um, that needs some kind of management or consume other people's data. Um, uh, that needs tools to, to, to help to do that. And in many cases, projects simply produce and consume data. Um, and so data resources, the, the, the databases and the services that, that support the data management and data flows uh, are absolutely critical to any life science research. And this is whether you're working within academia, you're working um, in, the, in, the, in the private sector, you're working for government, um, or and, and, and which domain you're in, whether you're looking at you know, crop breeding, you're looking at basic science, you're a microbiologist, wherever you are, um, you're using data resources uh, quite frequently on a daily basis. So it's an absolutely crucial set of resources that make up an infrastructure. It's highly distributed, and, and typically the parts of the infrastructure, the individual biodata resources emerge in response to a, a scientific need. Um, they're led by a group of scientists who happen to be getting interested in a particular data type or a particular domain of science, and things grow from there. So there's no top-down coordination of this. No one's saying, right, we need to have this component and that component. It emerges in response to need, which is great. It's dynamic uh, and it's responsive, but it brings challenges, as we'll see. So there are very few cases, I think, where one can justify redoing scientific experiments or observational work um, over uh, capturing and preserving data. Uh, and in many cases, it's simply not possible to repeat the science. And so it's absolutely essential that we preserve data and make data reusable. Um, there are opportunities. So as we advance, as technology advances, the life sciences become increasingly data intensive. Um, and this is important for the infrastructure as a whole because we're really, we really need to be in position. We need a strong, healthy infrastructure that will be able to support the advances and enable the advances that can be made with that increasing data intensivity. But challenges exist. So the demand on the system is increasing. Um, as technology advances, people can produce more and more data um, with the same, um, the same machines or new machines uh, for the same equivalent experiment one has 
higher data rates, higher data volumes. Um, this creates more demand on the system. We all love open access policies and we all promote them, but of course they themselves bring extra demand on the infrastructure. As new technologies emerge, new platforms, new assay platforms, we have to deal with new data types. That means more, more, the system is more stretched. Um, and as data science advances, it slurps up more and more data. So there's more demand on the, uh, on the consumer side as well from, from advanced methods in data science. So even without this increasing demand, there'd be sustainability challenges. Um, funding for data resources has been haphazard. It's been very short term um, and very um, unsystematically distributed. There's very little global coordination between the, the organizations that fund data resources. Um, and the, 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 the management of the infrastructure as a whole really isn't like that of that particle accelerator or that, 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 that telescope. Um, it's really not been uh, coordinated in, in the same kind of way. And if you look at the right here, this is a plot from, so this gives a European view from back in 2018, and this is looking at the, um, so taking the Elixir core data resources, so a set of, uh, of the, the, the large uh, data resources from Europe, um, this is looking at the funding window moving forward from 2018. And so back in 2018, um, th this was a, a, we captured the, or the, the group that did this in Elixir captured the, um, the budgets, the committed budgets available to these groups, measured it in, in FTEs. Um, and they look forwards. And you can see that after three years pass from 2018, uh, things drop really dramatically to a point that we imagine will, will make things unsustainable for people. So a typical time window for funding for these really important data resources is something like three, four years. Um, and that's really problematic for long-term planning, uh, for strategizing in any way. So the Global Biodata Coalition is a group of uh, life science research funding organizations that come together um, recognizing the essential nature, nature of uh, biodata resources for their research programs. In order to deliver their research programs, uh, they need to have uh, access, they, their researchers need to have access to these data resources. They recognize as well that because of the, the, the um, issues with sustainability, the system is, uh, is threatened, the system, things are precarious, and there is a risk that parts of the system stop working. Some data resources will, will stop existing. So the funders, except they need to cooperate um, uh, around the world to, to find a solution to make things more sustainable. And they come together around what you see on the right there, a letter of understanding that lays out some of these principles and some of these commitments. So at the moment, we have 13 different uh, funding organizations, many of them involved already in funding uh, some, of the, some of the substantial um, efforts going on in, in biodata resources. Um, and on the right-hand side, we have a number, at any one time, we have a number of observer organizations. So these are life science research funders that are somewhere on a path, we hope, to full membership of, um, of, of the Global Biodata Coalition. And so the story behind GBC, well, the, the issues around sustainability have not been known for, for, for many years, um, but a burst of activity around 2015, 2016 really got people coming together with funders to start to look at this. Um, and there was a meeting, so my, um, my other, so I, I spend some of my time with the Global Biodata Coalition, some of my time with um, uh, the, the EMBL at the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, and, and I really came to this in 2016. Uh, there was a meeting late in the year um, that brought together a number of people who, from the infrastructure side, so I was there representing ENA and, and INSDC, the International Collaboration, and various funders and various leaders of different institutions uh, to discuss what could be done. And, and from there, a group of people picked this up and really drove and, and eventually some funding. The first funding came in in 2018, 2019, and things began to happen. So um, by uh, 2020, um, we were beginning on the scientific program. Um, and really, over the last year and a half or so, things have really moved quite quickly. Um, so I, I see this really in 2023 that, that GBC is sort of coming of age and becoming more visible to people. Um, uh, what we have is a global community of research funding organizations um, that are actively in, engaging in the discussion that we need to have. Um, we have uh, from those, from the member and the observer organizations, we have two very active working groups, and I'm going to talk, I'm going to come back to most of these things, two very active working groups that are, that are looking at how they can adapt to, to greater sustainability. Um, we've had the first selection of global core biodata resources, and we built an inventory of, of, of the longer tail of, of data resources around the world as well. 
Um, we've reached out to lots of different uh, meetings, and um, we're talking more directly to, to, to many new funders and other stakeholders. Uh, so things are progressing um, quite nicely. We're en route to having an independent legal structure. That's something we have to do to, to, to enable us to sustain our activities over time. We have a, a very active um, scientific advisory committee um, that's, that's highly engaged, um, and you'll recognize some faces there. Um, and uh, we recruited a team, a small team, but a team that is, um, is very energetic and productive at the Secretariat. And this is the team here. So many of you will recognize uh, many of the people um, on, on this slide. We're small, we're very active, um, we will possibly grow to an extent, but we're not aiming to be a huge organization. Really, we're a, a coordination point uh, to allow others to, to, to do things and to move towards sustainability. So our vision is um, that biodata essential to science are freely and openly available to all, with long-term access assured through the tools and services offered by global biodata resources. A breadth and diversity of funders around the world are aligned and committed in their support for secure and sustained core biodata resources. Achieving global inclusivity, all countries have the opportunity to benefit from and contribute to biodata resources. And an engaged community of funders, scientists, and resource managers shares a culture of ownership of and responsibility towards global biodata resources. And then to deliver on this vision, our two principal aims are to be a forum uh, for the funders of biodata resources, uh, enabling better coordination, sharing approaches and strategies um, to, to, to manage and grow the infrastructure appropriately. And second, to stabilize and ensure sustainable financial support for the global biodata infrastructure, with a focus initially on a prioritized set of global core biodata resources that are crucial for sustaining the, the, the entirety of the infrastructure. And so how we work, well, really, it's about two pillar communities that together need to, to, to work to build sustainability. On the left-hand side, we have the, the community of people that operate, that lead, and manage the, the, the biodata resources themselves. And then on the right-hand side, we have the life science research funding organizations that, that, that support, that provide the, the financial support to, um, uh, that will ultimately hope uh, increase the sustainability of the data resources. And so we have to work with these two groups, and we have to find the opportunities between these two groups to, to, to move to greater sustainability. So that involves building the models, asking the question, I'll come back to in a second, asking the question, what is sustainability? What does it look like? Um, and then building mechanisms. So mechanisms through which international or different funders around the world uh, can cooperate at the international level to support international, global bio, uh, international biodata resources. And then, of course, the governance and the, the administration to support all of that. And so this question of sustainability is, is really important. Um, when we talk about biodata resource or biodata infrastructure sustainability, it means different things to different people. And so on the left, we have the, um, the view that is more typical from those people involved in running biodata resources. On the right, we have the view of sustainability that is more typical of those involved in funding uh, research programs that have a dependence on, um, on biodata resources. And I can expand this a lot. I hope you can see it. Yes, you can probably see a little bit of that. Um, but essentially, um, it, it, fin finances are really important. Funding things appropriately is, is absolutely necessary. And without that funding, uh, other things really can't exist. But funding alone is not sufficient. There's a whole load of other things we need to think about when we think about sustainability. Um, so beyond the finances, uh, a data resource manager cares about being able to attract and retain the right kind of staff to run the resource. They care enormously about the community of users and, and providers around the resource. So who, you know, where are the data feeds coming from? Where are the data consumers? Where is the, the, the training and the support network? Are we getting feedback from the user community? Are our services improving based on what the requirements of the users are? Um, data resources care about partner data resources because everything is typically very connected. They consume and they provide. The, sustain the sustainability of these other data resources is really important for, for my data resource as I look around. Um, the relationship with the, the publishers is important. Are they a recommended resource for citation or for, for deposition? Um, the uh, connection with policy and regulation in, in whichever domain it is. Uh, the hosting, the appropriateness of the, of the technical hosting, the infrastructure that's, that, that supports the data resource, governance and so on. So this is a, a typical view, and I'm going to come back to this a little uh, later on. Um, a typical view uh, from the perspective of someone who, who, who is involved in operating a biodata resource. 
But then at the level of the, uh, the funder, there's an interest really in the, the infrastructure as a whole. So not so much the individual data resources, but the collection of the data resources and how they work together in, in this ecosystem. They care, of course, about the finances. They're still, still critical. But they care about things like coverage. You know, it, the right kind of data types covered by, as a whole by the infrastructure. Uh, there, are all of the scientific domains that our research programs uh, are concerned about, are they covered by the infrastructure? Is the system stable? Do the components have life cycle management? So is there a, a way in which a data resource that becomes uh, no longer uh, important, that it can be deprecated smoothly, its data can be preserved, and so on? Um, is there political neutrality? What happens if something strange happens in one country and they're the only provider of that particular data resource? Um, uh, what's the overall value to different stakeholders? Um, is there good community around the infrastructure as a whole? Is there engagement? How responsive is the system? If something happens in science, can the, you know, can the ecosystem as a whole adapt to that? Can it build new systems? Can it, can it adapt and can it steer and, 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 and lean towards, um, and redirect towards uh, important priorities? Is it inclusive? Uh, is it fair? Is there equity in the system? Um, how connected is the system? Is there redundancy? If one thing fails, you know, is there something else that some people can use instead? Or, or you know, are there, are there strong dependencies on, on fragile components? Um, what is the capacity? Is it big enough to support the research programs that we want to run? Um, and is it cost effective and, and, and efficient? Um, so again, I'll come back to this a little bit later on as well. Um, the perspective from the, the funders is typically not the same as the perspective from those operating the data resources. And part of the GBC's work is to find the common ground and to build that that, that model um, and those mechanisms between the two pillar communities. So onto some of the things that we're doing. And the, the first is what the data, resource, um, data resources are working on or helping us to work on. Um, and it's about scoping and it's about prioritizing. And so the first thing we, we've done, and this is work that will come out in, um, well, in publication uh, soon, but in preprint form, I'm hoping in the next few days or, or, or certainly weeks, um, uh, this is an inventory of, of global biodata resources. So we're trying to understand, there is no list of, of what exists around the world. We're trying to understand what exists and get some information back about those. And so we wanted to create a, as comprehensive as possible an inventory, given time and, and resource limitations. Um, we wanted to do this in a way that we could um, have methodology that was reproducible. We would be able to rerun this in two years' time to find all the new data resources and see, what's, uh, see, see if anything's dropped off. Um, and of course, we're not the only people in the world who care about the complete list of, of, of biodata resources, so we, um, we're trying to make this interoperable with, with other resources where they um, catalogs and registries where they exist. And so we took a, um, a, a literature-based approach, um, figuring that if, if you're running a data resource and you want people to access it from outside your institution, you're likely to publish it. And that's, for, for many of us, that's a, certainly an existing model that's used. Um, and so running the, the, I won't go into the details of the, of the process, but we've identified over 3,000 by data resources using this method. Um, we took a 10-year window. We used Europe PNC, the literature resource, um, it's a combination of search and, and machine learning approaches. Um, uh, so uh, we found candidate articles um, based on abstracts and titles. We pulled out names and pulled out URLs. Uh, and then we went back into the metadata associated with the articles for the hits and, and tried to find some more information, particularly about funders and, and the geography of the, of the services. Um, and so on, on the right here, you can see how, uh, how we went through, how things fell through this pipeline. So um, something like 4,000 articles may describe a data resource, but we could only pull out a name for 4,006 uh, for, 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 um, uh, 4, of those. Um, we couldn't get URLs for everything. Um, we uh, found that there were lots of duplicates, some of which we could, we could remove automatically, some of which we couldn't. Um, but that reduced the number. So we end up with something like 3,000 different data resources uh, in different parts of the world. Now, there are, there are caveats with this because, you, you know, what, you, we can only find what goes in. Um, we're limited by how well annotated things are. So if you're not published and you're not um, indexed in Europe PNC, then you're not going to be in, 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 our, in our hit list. Um, so it's not yet comprehensive. But we can do already various things with this. Um, so from those 3,000, uh, we can identify funding sources. So there's, in the metadata, there's marked up funding sources for 55% of the resources, and they're linking to 1,800 1, uh, funding organizations, or what you think of funding organizations, of some type. Um, 
And the majority of these, 80% or 79%, are associated with just a single resource. So this is a, a, a distribution with a tail. And then a, a, small, a small percentage have you know, multiple, the, the, the same funder is funding multiple resources. But there's a huge long tail here um, uh, to, to explore of different funders. Examples of other things we can do, well, you can look at those multi-resource funders and you can look at the distribution. Um, and, and now we have the data, we're beginning to analyze this, but this will be very useful for us in, in, um, in, in targeting, identifying funding organizations to work with, identifying um, data resource managers to work with, um, and, 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 and targeting and prioritizing. And so the application of this, um, this inventory for us really is to, to use this information to further the sustainability aims um, and we'll be reaching out to data resource managers and funders to do this. Um, so preprints coming out soon, it's, it's all open. We want to practice what we preach. Um, so this is um, the, the, the code, um, the, the data, um, and all of the tools we use, the libraries we use are all, all fully open. And we actually have a, two publications, one about the, the project overall and one uh, which is really about the reproducibility and looking at, at, at how we think we've been reproducible, but, but sort of asking as well, you know, are there in, in ways we can improve this? So the second data resource side activity has been the, the global core biodata resource selection process. So this is something we ran um, for the first time in 2022. Um, so it concluded, it took most of last year, it concluded in December. Um, we are running it uh, a, a, a second supplementary round uh, with, with the same criteria um, this year, so 2023, um, and that's, we're sort of halfway through the application, the expression of interest um, uh, application window, uh, and I think we have another couple of, a week or so um, for people to put in their expressions of interest. So the global core by data resources, we define these as those data resources that are, are fundamentally important to the wider biological and life science community um, and are important for the long-term preservation of data. And they need to show high levels of usage, um, high scientific quality, and high service levels. And we, we come up with a number of, of criteria. Uh, and the selection process is based on an external um, expert review um, based on, on, on criteria or indicators derived from these. So the, the access to the data has to be free and open. Um, the resources have to be used extensively, both um, at high rate uh, but also with high you know, geographical distribution, so they have to be global. Um, they are mature and they're comprehensive in their domains. Um, they're considered authoritative in their fields, so they're the go-to resources that, that, that people working in that area um, uh, access. They have high scientific quality, uh, and they provide a professional standard of service delivery, which involves you know, support, training, professional interfaces, and so on. And so why we focus first on these global core biodata resources really is that, that, that you know, we think of this as an ecosystem and we think that the whole ecosystem requires these core data resources um, to operate smoothly. Um, and if you think of a biological ecosystem, the, the, the GCBRs, the global core biodata resources, are really the keystone species. So they're the most highly connected or the most deeply connected and their removal has the biggest impact on the ecosystem. And so although not everyone will be, or it's not appropriate for everyone's resource to become a, a global core biodata resource, uh, and, and, and GCBR doesn't mean you're good or bad, it just means you meet a set of criteria. Um, but if you're not a GCBR, then the principle is that, well, if we, if we prioritize sustainability within the GCBRs first, then everything around those GCBRs is likely to see some benefit from that. So it has an impact on the whole of the ecosystem beyond the GCBRs themselves. So in 2022, we had the round of selection. We've identified 37 GCBRs, many of them represented in this, in, in this room. Um, a lot of detail about this is available. We're very grateful to the review committee um, uh, and, and the support we got actually from, the Elix from Elixir and the Elixir Hub. Um, and I think many of the reviewers are, are in the room as well, or certainly involved in the bioculation community. Um, so th there's all sorts of things we can do with this, and we're beginning to do some of the analysis. Um, I'm not going to go into huge detail here, um, but you know you can look at the the, country, the distribution of countries that host data, that mirror data. You can look at the funding distribution, um, which is actually more globally distributed. The bottom left more globally distributed than we expected it to be. You can look at the different domains. So there is a you know it's dominated by things on the genomic side, but there's representation of ecology and biodiversity in there as well which is nice to see. Um, and then, you know, you can look at the, the, the kinds of service that are provided and the, the bulk of them are 
knowledge bases, so they're adding some value to primary data, um, but a good proportion also have deposition functions and some are just dedicated deposition databases. So anyway, there's, the data set is, um, is, is, is there and, and, and available for um, all sorts of exploration in future. And so lots of people stand to benefit uh, from this GCBR process. That includes the GCBRs themselves, and I'm going to come back to that and focus more on that. Um, but the scientific research community as a whole, um, the funders, both those that are funding um, data resources already and those that have research programs that, are, that, that, that um, necessarily involve the use of data resources, they stand to benefit. The publishers benefit. Um, perhaps it's a target, an aspiration for some of the emerging data resources. Um, and, and everyone benefits from a, a well-structured infrastructure uh, that's working efficiently uh, with open data. It's a real enabler of, of, of scientific progress. But I want to focus a bit more on the, the GCBRs, as this, that's probably most interesting to this, this particular community. Um, and so the GCBR selection is not a, it's, it, it's not a funding, um, it's, it's not a project that, or becoming a GCBR doesn't immediately give you access to funding. Um, it doesn't, uh, alas, work like that. Rather, it's, it's an investment um, that creates the right opportunity in the right environment for funding, or that's, what, that's the way we want to take it. Um, but certainly, becoming a GCBR gives you a voice um, with, uh, alongside the other GCBRs with funders, with policy makers, publishers, and, and with the scientific community. Um, so to an extent, it's a symbol, we hope, of, of utility. Um, but also, it's practically useful, in, 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 such as in signposting and promoting data resources. So when, a, when a, um, an institutional policy wants to say, well, if you're producing these data, you have to share them here, or a publisher wants to say, well, if you're citing this kind of data set, then you need to use IDs from this database, then it's, you know, if you're a GCBR, you, you, you're more likely to be um, able to be on that list. And we, we will promote to these different stakeholders the use of the GCBR um, uh, list to, to help to do this signposting and, and do this promotion. Um, so the GCBRs will be exposed to new models for finance. Um, working as a GCBR in the GCBR community um, is also about sustaining those partner resources, the providers and the consumers that are connected to your GCBR in this network. Um, uh, there will, I hope, be opportunities for collaboration and, and, and partnership, sharing experience and, and good practice, um, and opportunities to explore new approaches and new data standards and so on. Um, but I think also it, it's a great opportunity to drive global engagement inclusion um, agendas and to drive the, the, the open data agenda as well. Um, and so specifically, we, we, we put together a forum of the, the managers of the GCBRs. So we've met once so far. Um, there's another meeting coming up next week. And it's really through this forum that we hope to drive some of these developments. Um, and so this is about building community. It's about working together to explore what sustainability looks like and how we move towards sustainability. It's about testing implementation. So when there is an international, a proposed international cooperative model for funders to work together to support biodata resources, we need to test that in the, in the resource community. Um, so the group really must drive towards outputs, including um, uh, this, this, um, this testing and evaluation, um, but also getting more of the, the funders engaged. So not all of the funders of GCBRs are members of, of GBC, so they're not yet in the conversation. Um, and it's about building sustainability models uh, and, and planning. And by sustainability models, um, I'm now going back to that early slide I showed, talking about the, the, you know, what, what sustainability means to people involved with data resources. And really what I think we need to do is work towards a, a model that includes a set of indicators that can assess the different elements of sustainability uh, for any one resource at any time. Uh, and this would be a set of indicators um, for, for, for GCBRs or, or others to evaluate um, a particular resource. Um, it would be a set of goals to aspire to for those who want to become global core biodata resources, um, or perhaps for other data resources, perhaps selectively. Um, but it also gives a view of sustainability for funders. So for those funders already funding a data resource, it will be an opportunity to say, well, this is well supported, this is well supported, but, but you know, this, isn't, this element of sustainability needs further work, it needs further investment. Um, so ha perhaps that's useful for the GCBR to go back to its funder. Um, but also for the GBC, from our perspective, it gives us an opportunity to assess at any one time the, the, the state of play and you know, are the interventions that we've been able to coordinate from the funders are they suitably or appropriately improving the sustainability and how are they improving that sustainability? 
So I now switch over to a look at what's happening on the funder side. Um, so this is about the interactions that, that GBC is having with its members and its observers. Um, and, and when I say, I've been saying funder or, or life science research funding organization, really because every life science research activity requires biodata resources, that means that our definition of, of a funding organization is very, very broad. And so, so far we have uh, nationally linked funding agencies um, uh, and, 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 and perhaps some government, um, some government departments. Uh, we have uh, large charitable foundations um, but we hope in future to add commercial players, so perhaps pharma companies, um, uh, agri-tech companies. Uh, we hope to add perhaps interest groups, special interest groups, smaller individual level philanthropies, and all sorts of different different funders. So if you're a funder of um, if you're a funder of, 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 of life science research, then we argue that you you are a potential supporter of, of the Global Biodata Coalition because you have a, a stake in the game. Um, so a big push, uh, a constant push, is to recruit more funders. Here you're looking at the distribution of funders and observers. So we cover parts of the world, but we don't cover all of the world, and we certainly want to uh, want to rectify that. Um, we don't, there is no, just as there's no list of, of global biodata resources, there's no list of funders, um, but we can pull, we can help to, the, the, the inventory in the GCBR forum will help us to get to that. Um, we then need to reach out, and we need to engage and, and make the case for involvement. Um, we need to run uh, and continue to run a, a compelling membership program to keep, keep the funders engaged. And really that is based around the, 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 the value of the infrastructure to the research programs that those funders who are considering membership um, are, 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 are gaining from a, a healthy ecosystem of biodata resources. And so uh, we can continue to advance, but with more funders and better representation, we can advance more quickly and we can and achieve more, I believe. So um, last year, about this time, the, um, we, we set up two different working groups, and these working groups are, um, the, the members are from, of the working groups are uh, from organizations that are members of GBC or observers of GBC, and both of them have been working quite actively and deeply um, and, and making, making progress on laying out the challenges, uh, laying out the space, and, and, and providing some of the thinking and some of the input that, that we will need to, to, to deliver sustainability. Um, the first working group is on open data strategies, um, and there's an appreciation within this group that really openness in data is absolutely key. Open data is an enabler and an amplifier, and really you can't achieve sustainability without a high level of openness of data. Um, they're exploring uh, very actively their existing policies, such as for open data, data sharing, data release, uh, data management planning, data persistence, and so on. Um, exploring those policies and asking, well, what, can, what should be aligned um, to, to, uh, across the different, um, different funders and what can be aligned. And that alignment is, is sort of with a view to providing a, a system of aligned policy that is more uh, conducive to um, whatever future international cooperative mechanisms exist for actually doing the funding. Um, so what policy needs to be brought together and aligned to um, really to deliver international bi um, biodata resource sustainability. The second working group on um, sustainability is defining a set of premises about you know, who, where responsibility lies, um, for example, and a set of principles for sustainability. What, what was a sustainable system look like? And a lot of that is about going back to that question what, from a funder perspective, looking at the whole of the ecosystem, looking at the whole of the infrastructure, uh, what does sustainability look like? Um, uh, and, and this group has actually uh, already got as far as exploring potential mechanisms that could be used to allow internationally funders to work together to support international uh, data resources. Uh, so that's already leading to some of these, these, these possibilities. Um, and so back to this, uh, this question of the, what the infrastructure looks like uh, from the from the um, the funder perspective, um, and I've already been through this, but but really defining exactly what this means and pulling out the elements that, that are essential for the the cooperative model, the cooperative mechanism, um, are, are really key to this group's work. So, both of these groups are working towards white papers and and hoping to publish those white papers either this year or very early next year. Um, uh, but they will enter a consultation phase, um, uh, hopefully over the summer. Um, and, and so each of them will consult separately. There'll be a consultation paper and there'll be a, a process to gather information. And we very much hope that the, the biocuration community can be a part of that, that consultation along with other stakeholders. So 
Uh, finally, um, just to bring this to an end, I, I, I just wanted to ask myself, um, you know, what, what, this community here, um, how can GBC engage with it? What can we do that's useful? And how can this community engage with GBC and what can it do that's useful? Um, and I think really the, the essence of this is that, um, you know, biocurators are the people that typically lead the biodata resources. Um, they almost certainly all depend upon data resources. They work, this is the, the platform around which they work. Often it's the thing you log into in the morning. Um, they consume from all sorts of data resources and they provide to all sorts of data resources. So there's a huge dependence. Um, and, and really, if you're looking for an expert group in this area, then I think you come to, you come to buy curators. Um, so absolutely a key stakeholder community for the, for the, for the Global Biodata Coalition to, to deliver sustainability effectively. So we would, as I mentioned, we would really like to involve this group in, um, in, the, uh, in the consultation process for both the open data uh, consultation and the sustainability consultation um, and we will um, I guess come back to ISB with a proposal about how we how we do that um, there may be so we're currently in the middle of the 2023 round of GCBR selection so um, that the, the, the expression of interest um, window is open um, so it might be that there are further uh, proposals that should come from this group and if so uh, if there's eligibility we would really encourage that um, the existing so for the potential new members, but also the existing GCBR managers who are in this, in this, in this, in this group, um, active contribution to the GCBR forum will be really important. Uh, so we really encourage that. Um, we want the help of the biocuration community to engage the funders. So the, a lot of funders have research programs that absolutely depend on, on biodata resources running smoothly and, and, and being in a healthy ecosystem yet they don't make any contributions or they don't make major contributions. We really need the help of, uh, of, 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 of many stakeholders, but including by curators to make that case. And then when it comes to models, we, we, we really need the input on, um, on what sustainability, you know, what the sustainability models should be, um, how we use that and how we, uh, in particular, how we, we, um, we use that to advance the um, the sustainability of individual data resources, and that's going to be an iterative process. I don't think the model will be fixed, not least, certainly not for some time, um, but we really need sort of continual um, uh, input into that. So with that, I, um, I encourage you to track what we're doing, um, and, and I'll, I'll be around. Hopefully I'll speak to, to many more people as well, but I'll be delighted to take any questions or comments at this point. And thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Hey, um, I'm Colby Reed, University of Florida. Um, that was a brilliant talk, and I, I have, I'm sure all of us feel very connected to this goal and this mission statement, and really look forward to seeing what it does. But uh, I am curious, uh, have you tapped the database commons out of China for more statistics? Um, because they seem to be a, I, I know the politics are a little, uh, but you know. Uh, yeah, no. So they, so they. I mean, they have a very big effort to, um, to as you know, to yeah, um, to, uh, to to curate this list as well. So we've done an intersect analysis with the um, with the inventory we produced, and we find some overlap, but but some things that are not in the intersect. So, so actually that's, so that's in, in, that will be in the paper, well, it's in the papers already. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's also an intersect analysis with fair sharing. Unfortunately, we couldn't do it with the NAR database issue um, because it doesn't have a, it doesn't have a programmatic access point. Um, but, but yeah, so no, we, I mean, we don't, others, others are doing useful things here and we're, we're, we're trying to connect to all those as well. And, and of course we want to contribute to those. So our data are all open. I'm hoping that, that we will be, so for the inventory, so the fair sharing model, for example, um, I think the database commons is a, um, a, a curator driven model. So they go and find things, I think. But for fair sharing, which is a registration model, where the, 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 the owner of a data resource goes in and says, this is my data resource and describes it, um, we're hoping to encourage the people we find in the inventory to, to push their data resource into that as well. So that, so that the overall, the world has a better, more comprehensive list.
Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Raja Mazumdar from George Washington University. And uh, so I'm wondering, uh, for an effort like this, um, over time, biases might creep in in terms of the type of data types, depending on your advisory committee or depending on um, various factors. Um, so how do you, uh, or what uh, are the things that one could do to avoid su such biases creeping in into this collection of uh, resources? That's, thank you. Uh, this is a good question. Um, and actually running the inventory in the way we have done, um, I think it was a useful starting point because there we, I think we've, we've so some of the things that are not in this intersect um, are, are and, and, and honestly, we, we, most of the people involved in the Secretariat come from a, a, an omics background, uh, more from this kind of community. Um, but we've, we've, you know, we've found biodiversity databases, we've found ecology databases that, um, uh, that weren't really so much on the radar. So the, 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 the way of guarding against bias is to involve people who are involved in the governance uh, and the management of these data resources in the process as early as possible. Um, so that's the intention, and there are different opportunities to do that. Um, so hopefully we, have, we do have coverage from some of these people in, in the GCBR forum. Um, uh, we uh, have our opportunity with our advisory committee to um, extend uh, membership there to, 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 to represent some of, these, some of these groups and some of these interests. Um, and I'm hoping that as we recruit new funders, We'll also be able to to do that in a way that that, that sort of brings in um, influences and opinions from those areas that we might otherwise be biased against. But it's a it's this will be an ongoing challenge because you know we what is the definition of life sciences? Um, that was a difficult enough thing to do for the inventory process. But um, you know where, where does life sciences stop and environmental sciences start or health sciences start? So there are lots of there are lots of areas that we don't even really know what they are yet. Um, and so this will be an important part of our work. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, so maybe this is in the white paper, but um, so will the coalition approach the funders or is the kind of onus on the individual databases to sort of use it as a kind of, you know, badge of validation or something? I think the... <laughs> So I think the, the plan for the funders is that, that, that we do this together through the Global Biodata Coalition and we come up with a, I mean, there won't be one mechanism that solves this problem, but, that, but the, the, when I say mechanism, it will probably be a selection of different options that work for different groups. Um, so that, that really needs to be a, a sort of, over, there needs to be an overall plan to that rather than a, a pairwise you know, delivery, because that's what we have now and it, we know it doesn't really work. Um, however, having said that, you know, if, if you're a, a GCBR or if you're otherwise involved in, in the Global Biodata Coalition, this means that you're aware of sustainability and you've reached a, a level of, you know, advanced thinking that, that puts you in a, in, in a place where it's useful to communicate that to your, to your, to your funder. So we would also encourage the, the resources to, to go to the funders and, and say, well, you know, I'm now a GCBR. This means that, that, that I can prove that these people or independent expert reviewers have declared that this is really important and it can't go away, but I need support with this and support with that. Um, and to an extent, you know, we can try to help to help to broker or mediate that conversation. Certainly, we want to take examples uh, of, of particular areas of challenge to, the, to our board to present them. Um, but the, 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 the big drive is a strategic drive and it's slightly longer range to come up with this sort of solution that, that, that works and has sustainability in itself. This might, um, you might actually just have answered some of this in the last, uh, the answer to the last question, but I, was, I noticed you had the uh, Human Frontier Science Program organization on, on one of the slides as managing funds for the GBC. Is there any plan to work through them because I know they award, they award grants for research, if there was some. And for, for those of us you know, trying to compete for national funding that can be hard even when we're internationally competitive, um, you know, that, some ability to apply for, for some international source of funding for a, for a bioresource would be very useful. Yeah, so the, so the HFSPO is indeed, a, it's been a very successful international funder. Um, and the, the, the association we have is that they took an early interest in, in GBC. They realized that for their programs that they, you know, they're not about funding data resources, or they didn't think they were. They're not about infrastructure funding. 
Um, but they realised that, that the, the innovation funding, the, the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, frontier funding that they wanted to provide absolutely required these data resources and someone needed to look after it. So they, they helped to, um, or initiated lots of these discussions back in sort of 2015, 2016 and hosted many of them. And then um, they've hosted activities for GBC since then. So our secretariat is strictly based in, in, in Strasbourg, where, where HFSPO is based. Um, and uh, they've been very uh, supportive and, and very helpfully looking after our, our finances and so on. Now, we're building a separate legal entity um, because we need to have a, as a separation from them, but we, we hope to continue a strategic relationship. Um, so one of the challenges is when you have these multi-layer funders, so the contributors to HFSPO are um, all countries, some of which may want to have a direct relationship with, with GBC and some of which may not, and it's the same situation for the European Commission. So all the member states um, may want to have a direct relationship with, with GBC, um, or they may want to um, become members as a, as, as a commission. So, so we have this, this, this challenge about uh, or, or the funders and the, the, the organizations, that, the funders, particularly international funders, have this challenge about whether they join at the international level or at the component level. Um, so there's, there's some discussion about that, uh, but, but still there, there can be lots of support. But what we... In our, in our mechanisms, we need to have a system where there is, you know, it, there is a, a, a higher independence of location of where the activity happens and um, support, funding support where the, where, the, you know, where, the, where the money actually comes from. We have to be able to be freer over those. It's not, it's, it's, and, and when we talk about international cooperation, this could mean that you know, people are supported from multiple funding sources and they work in one place or they work in lots of different places. Um, but it, it could mean that money goes from one country to another. It could mean all sorts of different things. But fundamentally, you have to have a freedom about the geography of the work itself, the geography of the activity, and the geography of the funding um, in some way. So that's what the mechanism building is all about. So, I, I, so to the point, to the question, well, you know, what are we doing about, you know, we, we need international fundings, funding providers. Um, that is something we try to address with these mechanisms. Guy, uh, thanks, Guy. Val here. Oh, hello. Hi. <laughs> yeah, Val. <laughs> thanks for the the overview. It was interesting to see that the funders' criteria for, for sustainability was slightly different from the databases. I'd never seen that before. But at the first managers' meeting, we were asked to sort of give feedback on sustainability from our perspective. How do you think that differs from what we've already provided by adhering to all the indicators? Do you have any ideas about what that might include? Um, well, I think that I think they are they are different things. Um, so one is the is what we so one is the ideal. So what, what would we look like if we're sustainable? And the GCBR indicators is about what we're like now. Um, and although, you know, the GCBRs are, uh, have all met the, met the criteria um, and they perform well against the indicators, I don't think many of them are confident to say we are highly sustainable. And most of them are living within this three, four-year window. Um, and some of them, you know, are more, more urgent situations than that. So, um, so I think... I think the sustainability model is looking at what we need to have, or I think it should be what we need to have, genuinely to be sustainable over, you know, over multiple years uh, for, for, for the long term. And I think the GCBR process is bringing together those groups that are candidates for that sustainability. Um, but we need to understand from, from the GCBRs what it is they, what we need to understand more detail about what they do now, um, but we need to understand what, you know, what is their plan for sustainability? How are they, we, don't, we captured information about the funders, but we didn't capture information about, the, about what the next round of funding is going to be and what the long-term funding strategy is, for example. So we need to, working with the, the what's happening now and what the, the plan is for the GCBRs and working with this ideal, we need to sort of try to bring these together. So I think, that's, I think they're slightly separate things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that uh, the... Hi, oh, sorry. Right, right here. 
Uh, at the beginning of the talk, you, you mentioned this is this is supposed to apply in, in its first conception to resources, if they went away tomorrow, would become the most impactful and the most problematic. So I have a question about other kinds of resources. Um, and, and then also the second preface is most of the resources in your list of 37 are quite big. They have a lot of turnover and they change often, maybe on the scale of hundreds of thousands, millions or more records or, or submissions and the kinds of things. What about other kinds of data resources that are typically smaller, that uh, don't have so much churn, or, or also maybe a little bit younger than, than the ones which are on the list, which have you know, been around for 20 years, that people have been working on for an entire career? Um, what, what do you think uh, will the, uh, the core resources expand to also encompass some of these small, but also fundamental resources, but are, are not so much like uh, yeah, at the front of, of all of the, the communication? Yeah, so I, 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 think, I think it will expand, but, I think, uh, but it will gain, uh, but I think it will also lose over time, and that's a good thing because there'll be some, uh, some resources that are GCBRs now that, that will be, I don't know, subsumed by other resources as their domain becomes less of a, a specialist thing. You know, who, that all sorts of things can happen. There could be mergers. So I think, I think we'd see it's a dynamic grouping, and we have to run the selection process you know, every, every, at least every few years to, to make sure we have the right list. Um, but there are some data resources, so I don't think size is directly, uh, and, and, and dynamic nature of the data, so churn, as, as you put it, I don't think they're necessarily good indicators of whether you're core or not. Um, uh, you can imagine, um, you know, you can imagine a, a data set being sort of fixed in time because no one's generating new data and it's sort of perfect, it's perfectly curated, there could be such a thing, maybe. Um, and you can imagine that that would be, remain critically important. Now, whether that's a, it could be a data set within a within a GCBR that's doing other things as well, or it, it could be it's a freestanding thing. So I don't I don't think alone those those are sort of counter indicators, um, but I expect that the smaller data resources with less churn may be more specific, maybe more domain specific and more focused, um, and so they're less likely to be um, uh, such big have such big influence on the rest of the ecosystem. But that's just this is sort of speculation. Um, but we prioritize the GCBRs, but we don't, but that doesn't mean we don't care about the rest of the ecosystem. And we do, over time, we will try to develop programs that re can really help other data resources as well. So we do hope, genuinely hope, that the, the GCBR process will, um, any sustainability gains there will help other data resources, because nearly ev well, everything is connected, I think. Um, but we, we also want to do specific things. Um, so, but that's, you know, that's, that's sort of for the, for the slightly longer term future. Okay, can I just finish with a comment? I'm just curious if you are planning to promote this uh, Global Bio Data Coalition initiative also on a larger scale uh, or the um, life science community, you know, that is not really in our field, in order to, you know, make them aware of the quality of the resource that you are actually uh, supporting. Because I have the feeling that it's not always so clear to the scientific community yeah I uh, no, I, I agree uh, we would like to do this but it's it, in, and we will try but there are limits because there are so many you know so many places you could go and present and and, and and talk to people I think I mean one of the challenges is and this is a you know we've all been very successful in the in the in the bio curation in the bio data resource world when um, a scientist in a lab somewhere dials up a gene or dials up a structure and they just find it, and they use it, and they say, great, yeah, I use this, this PDB structure, this, here's the accession. Um, and then they move on, and they've had a very brief interaction, they expected to find something, they found something that's really useful, it helps them with their work, and off they go. That's an infrastructure working really well. But the, the nature of that kind of infrastructure is that people, when they're using it, they don't, know, they don't have to think about it. And you don't want every user to say, oh, well, now I'm using PDB, and now I'm doing this, and, I know this, and oh, and they're funded by them, and oh, I have to... You, know, you don't want people to be bothered by that, but equally you want enough awareness to think, well, actually, this is a really, you know, this is like a, a machine in the lab or a, a reagent. This is really important for my work. If I don't have this, things will suffer. Um, so you need some awareness, and, and you particularly need it for the, you know, the, the people that are reviewing the grant applications and, and considering things like, or should be considering things like data management plans. You need it for people who are, um, who, who are, who are on panels um, assessing people's, you know, the, the, the performance of people in their careers and institutions. Um, that are making major data science contributions, um, but but um, not you know not necessarily being 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 um, recognised for that. 
um, and being sort of measured by more traditional research. So, so you need an awareness to, to enable the, 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 the biodata resource infrastructure to be known enough to the right people at the right times to make the right decisions. So I, we, we do need to do this. It's a, huge, it's a huge thing. There are lots of life scientists um, around the world to reach. But. So if there's not any more questions, thanks again. Uh, let's thanks our keynote.